I once had a 31-year-old woman having their gallbladder removed, totally routine and elective surgery, but at the end of their surgery, they woke up trying to bite my fingers off, pulled out their IV, blood everywhere, kicked the surgeon, punched the nurse in the face. In fact, they didn't remember anything for the next day. And this patient was otherwise totally healthy except for an incredibly wound up central nervous system and she was displaying what we believe to be the side effects of PTSD that are revealed and unleashed under surgery and anesthesia. There are three things that can come up and if you know about them, you can help prepare yourself and your surgery team for them so that you don't end up hurting yourself or others if you have been traumatized in the past so that you can have the safest and best outcome after surgery. Number one is recognizing that if you have had traumatizing memories in the past, you might not be able to access them. We call them state dependent memories. And you might not be able to access that memory unless you go into that state again. That state is a combination of different neurochemicals and possibly the mind state as well. Maybe the vulnerability, maybe the fear. We really don't know because the subconscious is a very complex place. But what we do know is that surgery can recreate a lot of physical trauma. We know that anesthesia can contribute to that trauma, like when this blade goes into your mouth to place the breathing tube. And we know that our anesthetic medications like propofol are GABA agonists, meaning that they can recreate some of the neurochemical environment in your brain extrasynaptically that can actually help release or retrieve those memories that may have otherwise been repressed. Those repressed memories are a consequence of disassociative amnesia. It's one of the two main memory derangements that PTSD can cause, the other being uncontrollable retrieval of memories, what we call flashbacks. When my patient was waking up on the operating room table, they were probably having some element of a flashback or some hyper arousal response and when that fear kicks in and you have the anesthesia in your brain that leads to a free flow of that fear, it can lead to emergence agitation or emergence delirium. That emergence delirium is more common in patients with PTSD. And emergence delirium can cause all sorts of complications, worse pain after surgery. It can lead you to stay in the hospital longer to help treat those complications. And evidence is accumulating that it may increase the risk of dementia later in life in susceptible individuals. We don't know yet if preventing delirium can prevent dementia, but I'm gonna go with the precautionary principle or maybe common sense and say that if we can help reduce the risk of delirium in the operating room, in the ICU, at any point after surgery, it's probably better for my fingers to not be bitten off and for your brain. Number two is recognizing that patients with PTSD are often taking medications, either prescribed or recreational, to help keep their symptoms at bay. And these medications can absolutely have interactions with the anesthesia and with what surgery does to your brain and body. Some common examples are mirtazapine, which is an alpha-2 antagonist in part, which can counteract the effects of the main medication that we give to patients with PTSD, dexmedetomidine, or an alpha-2 agonist. Also, many antidepressants can prolong your QT interval, which can compound what the anesthesia gases do that come out of the ventilator back here, and what medications like Ondansetron or Zofran, the main anti-nausea medication, can do. So if you have a long QT from the medications that you're taking at baseline for your PTSD, we might not be able to use all the medications we ordinarily would want to to help your surgery be more comfortable. And at the very least, you need to tell your anesthesiologist all the medications that you're taking, including any non-prescription drugs, things like cannabis, alcohol, or benzodiazepines that you don't have a prescription for, because these can increase your anesthesia requirements, especially cannabis, which can 2x or double your anesthesia requirements. And if we don't know that about you, if we don't know 
what your brain is prepared for, we might not be able to give you the right dose of anesthesia medications. That can lead to being underdosed. That can lead to perhaps waking up with worse pain, maybe more susceptible to a flashback, and possibly being traumatized with anesthesia awareness. Have you ever experienced PTSD or medical PTSD before and had surgery? Let me know what your experience was like in the comments below so others can learn from what you experienced. Number three is related to the way that your body keeps score after being traumatized or injured or hurt. And that's in the form of a predisposition or a susceptibility to central sensitization. Central sensitization refers to your spinal cord and your central nervous system being like a jack-in-the-box that is one crank away from pop, exploding. And that one crank away could be a very innocuous or minimal stimulus, like somebody just pinching your finger, and that can lead to extreme pain if your spinal cord is sensitized and ready to interpret any little input as a major threat. It's like a classic trigger in the PTSD model, except for pain, and there's no question that the physical pain that can come after surgery is absolutely heightened by the emotional and psychological pain that patients with PTSD suffer from. Central sensitization can lead to higher postoperative opioid requirements. More opioids can mean more side effects, more nausea, more vomiting, more constipation. And of course, the longer the opioids are needed after surgery, the greater the chance of dependence or addiction. And that doesn't even describe how unpleasant and dangerous undertreated postoperative pain can be, both physically and psychologically, potentially increasing the risk of infections or frozen joints or blood clots. If you have PTSD, you need to tell your anesthesiologist and your surgeon so that we can use the right medications for you. There's no clear cut answer for what the best medication is, but it typically involves avoiding benzodiazepines because those can further short circuit fear responses from the amygdala out to how your body reacts after anesthesia and surgery like the patient I told you about. There's certainly a role for alpha-2 agonists like clonidine and dexmedetomidine or Presidex. Ketamine has also been studied in patients with PTSD having surgery because of its modulation of glutamate which is one of the neurotransmitters that is absolutely deranged during PTSD and during surgery. And on top of the medications, having a care team that knows your history and knows to wake you up in a quiet place, not with music blaring, not with people giving you a jaw thrust or a sternal rub or going into an unknown environment with unknown faces when you're vulnerable after surgery can make or break the difference between a smooth, wake up and one that's at high risk of emergence delirium or agitation, which can lead to all those complications we talked about, especially cognitively. If you have had PTSD before or know a loved one or a friend who has PTSD and is gonna be going into a hospital for surgery or another procedure, please encourage them to advocate for themselves or you be their champion so that someone can advocate when they're vulnerable or maybe if they can't speak or if they're post-op and delirious and can't advocate for themselves. You can have incredible power over your health even in these vulnerable times if you know what to expect and preparation is key if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and tell me what else you want to learn about when your brain is revealed under anesthesia.